All right, good morning. I'm Ellen Honigstock, the Senior Director of Education here at Urban Green. Urban Green's values are excellence, inclusion, collaboration, and engagement. We invite you to be mindful of these during the program, both when you're listening in and asking questions. And to ask questions throughout the presentation, you'll see the Zoom Q&A box. I'm sure you've done this before. Please submit questions whenever they come to you and read the other questions and upvote them. And that's those questions would be more likely to be asked during the Q&A session. I would really like to thank the New York City Accelerator for partner, partnering with us on this event. It's been great to work with them. This is the first in a series about how to finance your energy upgrades. And now I'd like to hand it over to our CEO, John Mandyke, who will be moderating the discussions today. Ellen, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to everybody. As Ellen said, I'm John Mandyke. I'm the CEO of Urban Green, and I'm really happy to moderate this important discussion this morning. We're thrilled that you joined us. We've got a great event for you today on a critically important topic. And in fact, maybe the topic that everybody asks the most, which is how to finance your energy upgrade. And we're gonna to start today uh, with Andrew Chintz from the New York City Accelerator, who's gonna lay out the financing landscape just to provide the backdrop and overview. Then we're gonna hear from four uh, great speakers who represent different financing options um, in the chain. Um, they're going to do a very brief uh, presentation uh, from we'll hear from each, and then we're going to have a moderated discussion uh, with all five of our panelists, and then we'll turn it over to the audience Q&A where you get to ask your questions too. Uh, so uh, add your questions uh, in the uh, Q&A section, and uh, please upvote those that you think uh, should be asked first and you find most interesting. So with that, uh, sit back, we're in for a great program. Let me turn it over to Andrew Chintz, the financing specialist from the New York City Accelerator. Andrew, take it away. Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. Um, as John says, I'm Andrew Chintz. I'm the financing specialist at the New York City Accelerator. Uh, and I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm thrilled that we're partnering with the Urban Green Council on this, this webinar. Um, we're all aligned on the same goal and the, uh, this collaboration extends our reach to even more stakeholders. Um, I think we have maybe over 300 attendees today and um, many of them are service providers and that, you know, by the service providers understanding the financing and delivering that to their clients, the building owners, this, this helps our reach go even further. Uh, so today's webinar is designed to be a very high level overview of the financing options that exist in the market today to finance energy efficiency or clean energy projects. Uh, and our goal here is to target all building owners, regardless of their familiarity with, uh, with financing generally. Um, and on that note, I'm just reminding the panelists to try to keep things, um, uh, any kind of industry uh, language or acronyms, just to explain them so that we can reach all the building owners. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. So just to put this all in context and why we're all here, 68% um, of New York City's emissions comes from buildings uh, and 90% of the buildings here today are still gonna be here in 2050. New York City has a, a, a decarbonization pathway to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. So many of uh, the, the city has developed many policies and laws around building decarbonization. And with that, they've also provided a, a, a free technical assistance for building owners to, to um, meet this goal. And that's what the New York City Accelerator is. And along this, this pathway, there will be, there's plenty of economic development opportunities. And we're also focused on an equitable transition so everybody um, benefits equally. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so the New York City Accelerator can help building owners. We are a, uh, a free uh, customized service sponsored by the, uh, by the city under the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, we provide uh, all kinds of technical assistance we help building owners assess their buildings and figure out what kind of improvements they can do to help meet the, the energy, uh, the local energy laws. Uh, we connect building owners with service providers, with relevant incentive programs, and also provide um, online trainings. You can go to the next slide. 
Uh, so who's eligible to use the New York City Accelerator? Any privately owned building that's at least 5,000 uh, can access the free services of the Accelerator. If it is a smaller building, we do have partner organizations that we can refer you to. Um, how does it work? You simply just reach out to us. We get we connect you with a, a dedicated account manager and the account managers are all organized by building tracks or building sectors. Uh, and they're your, they're your point person through the process. Um, how much does it cost? Again, this is a, a free service. You can go to the next slide. So um, among the suite of services that the accelerator provides, we also will help you with financing. You can go to the next. Uh, so the assistance that we can provide that you know I can help you with as the financing specialist is to identify the financing programs that are out there that are relevant to what to your particular needs based on the type of building that you are uh, and the the financial structure of the of the building, which essentially means that what what kind of existing debt is on the building. Um, and then once we've identified the relevant programs, I will assist you uh, in connecting you to the relevant lenders or capital providers, um, helping help you engage uh, in the process, um, help you understand the different products and uh, and and also, assess the different products and the, and the different options. You can go to the next slide. So just uh, why, why should we, why do we finance the uh, energy projects? A lot of, you know, a lot of build, building owners probably think that debt is sort of a last resort, but it's actually a very useful tool if, if used appropriately. Um, so obviously it will minimize or completely eliminate the need to come up with the upfront money for the project. Um, and not only can you address local law 97 requirements and eliminate penalties immediately, but if you look at the financing and look at a longer horizon, you can, you know, possibly meet those requirements in a longer on a longer term. Um, the financing can help a project move if it's being if it's stalled or or, or there's not enough money because it's a large project. Um, financing can help you preserve. The building reserves for other necessary uses. Um, if you are doing other work in addition to the energy uh, project, you can combine all that and potentially finance it together. So that makes the financing more efficient and lowers the um, or makes it efficient the uh, the, uh, the cost of the financing. Um, and of, and the um, financing the um, Energy projects um, re can reduce the uh, your utility or other operating expenses, and this is sort of the the main uh, or unique part about financing energy improvements is that you know you pay for the financing, um, you borrow the money, but you can actually create savings that in some cases are more can more than offset the amount to pay back the loan each year, and you could even come up with some net cash flow for the building, but at least the savings will help cover at least part of the, the, uh, the cost annually for the, for the repayment. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the way we sort of look at all the different financing uh, products is you sort of look at the building's life cycle. So, um, you know, most buildings when they're built, um, or acquired or renovated, they will usually have a mortgage loan. Um, and uh, during the course of that loan, um, or I should say at the end of that loan, is sort of the end of the building cycle. You're going to get a new loan. You're usually going to re, uh, reinvest in the building in, in different capital needs, um, upgrades. Uh, so if you are close to the end of your mortgage, if it's going to mature in the next year or two, this is a good place to finance your energy improvements. Um, there are some lenders that will also, if you're not at the end of the mortgage, will also provide you with a, what they call a supplemental mortgage, which is the ability to borrow more money um, at the same terms, and it just sits alongside your, your mortgage. Um, 
most buildings or most building owners are not ready to refinance or not at the end of their mortgage. So we have um, what we call mid-cycle stage uh, financing products. And um, that's probably where most building owners need to, need to look at. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, you can go to the next. So um, end of building cycle is typically a mortgage loan. Sometimes um, you can also get a green mortgage loan where the mortgage lender will provide a little bit more loan proceeds because you're going to be doing work that is going to create some savings, uh, energy savings. So they'll lend you a little bit more money and they sometimes will lower the rate slightly too. So that's kind of the end of the building cycle type of loan product. And uh, Danielle from CPC today will we'll be talking about this. The other products uh, fall into the mid-cycle uh, financing um, type. And um, we have New York City Accelerator Pace Financing. That's a mid-cycle it, product. It, it, it sits along the mortgage, alongside the mortgage. Um, and um, uh, Eric from um, uh, Counterpoint will uh, be discussing that today. Um, then we have also what I refer to as specialty finance companies. And these are specifically set up to lend in the energy uh, retrofit or energy project uh, space. Um, we have a local green bank, the New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation, and Curtis is here today to talk about that. Um, we also have um, 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 inclusive prosperity capital and uh, Kim will speak to that as well. And they, and these companies have various types of loan products that are geared towards um, energy efficiency or clean energy projects and their mid cycle projects. You can go to the next slide. Um, just, I want to make a note that, you know, this is not all of the, we won't be talking about every type of uh, loan product. There are uh, equipment lenders, uh, they can also do leases. Um, that's kind of another uh, uh, type of, of lender. Um, we also have non-debt financing solutions, and these are various types of, pro of products that um, are essentially uh, you, you enter into a kind of a full service contract where the service provider will plan the work, install or implement the work, and finance it, and it's all consolidated under one service contract that you enter into. And so we don't have time to do everything today. So we will have a, a, a follow-up um, webinar that will uh, talk about these products as well. I think it's already scheduled for March 23rd at 1 p.m. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a snapshot of our um, our, our financing roadmap. We have a financing toolkit. This is part of the toolkit. It's just, again, to, to get building owners acclimated to thinking about financing based on the type of building that you are and the type of project that you're trying to finance. And it, it's kind of just a start. Um, the main point here is that we, we encourage you to reach out to the accelerator. Um, we can help you really get into a more a deeper dive on your particular building and, and the specifics of it and um, help you through the process. So I think that's it for me. Um, I'm going to turn this over first to Danielle from CPC to talk about the end of cycle products. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. My name is Danielle Donnelly. I'm the Assistant Vice President overseeing the Community Preservation Corporation Sustainability Programs, as well as the manager of the Climate Friendly Homes Fund Program, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, CPC is a not-for-profit CDFI affordable housing lender focused on construction lending and first mortgage financing in New York and the tri-state area. Since 2008, CPC's sustainability platform has created and driven innovative solutions to support energy efficiency and now high performance and decarbonization efforts. CPC has published educational guides, developed methodologies for underwriting efficiency and performance into the first mortgage. Uh, and that's what Andrew was talking about, where we're taking account of the savings that you're getting from efficiencies in the building and you're able to leverage additional debt. 
Uh, we've conducted studies with our industry partners and pioneered tools, programs, and financial products aimed at increasing the sustainability and resiliency of the built environment. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it along. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so next, we're going to have Eric from uh, CounterPoint to talk about um, a mid-cycle product, um, PACE Financing, New York City Accelerator PACE Financing. Good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Alini. I'm the managing partner of CounterPoint Energy Partners. Uh, we are a PACE <clears throat> lender in, uh, in, in all products. We also do other energy products, but primarily to talk about PACE today. So we focus on basically the convergence of energy and real estate, having been real estate people ourselves, um, and using the PACE product as a driver uh, to create climate change. Uh, mostly we focus on behind the meter investing, which is basically at the building level uh, and the point of consumption of that particular energy product. And we finance all kinds of things, including renewables, energy efficiency, resiliency. PACE is a tool uh, that we that is often used uh, across the country in New York City. And uh, you'll be hearing from Curtis actually runs a PACE program uh, that allows the efficiency or renewables uh, to be financed through a public-private partnership that is set up between the city, NYSEG, and the capital provider to provide capital for those projects. So it is a P3 kind of project. Uh, PACE will finance 100% of the hard, soft, and related costs. So it would be the engineering, any of the related costs that are set up, for example, to open the walls, to put in better efficient items, as well as 100% of the hard costs of the HVAC system or the renewable that you might need. And the difference between PACE and other financings is that the PACE is then collected to back through the property tax bill. So it flows back to the lender through the, the taxing authority, in this case, New York City, uh, to repay the loan. Uh, <clears throat> that is done because PACE is generally a voluntary non ad valorem tax that the property owner is placing on his property or her property. And that allows them to create a very interesting, unique situation for their financing. One, it is a long-term financing. So it is generally 25 to 30 years with no balloon payment. So think about it like it's vendor finance of the individual HVAC system that you might be putting in or any other system uh, that is then paid back through the taxing system through this non ad valorem tax. PACE will basically finance any type of uh, 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 program asset that saves, the best way to think about it is it saves or um, is being used to deal with an electron. So we'll finance insulation, outdoor windows, exterior windows, doors, exterior, HVAC systems, renewables, um, building management systems, any other sort of asset class that in a product that is helping with the underlying saving or using an electron within the building. Um, one of the nice things about PACE, which is slightly different, uh, is because you are, if you are running a, uh, uh, a leased building, for example, that might be a corp, uh, office lease, if you're running a modified gross or triple net lease on your buildings, because PACE is a tax, you're able to collect that by raising the rent a little bit against the common area maintenance that you might have. And this helps with the split incentive. Property owners have to basically improve their buildings according to local law 97, uh, but they want to share some of that burden of a more efficient building with the underlying tenants. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the next person. Back to Ann. Thank, thank you, Eric. Um, so next we have um, Curtis from the uh, New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation. Great. Good morning. My name is Curtis Probst, CEO of NYSEEC, or New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation. Uh, if you could advance the slide, thank you. Uh, let me take a moment to introduce NYSEEC, then I'll talk about our financing solutions. We are a not-for-profit lender. We have operated in New York City and the surrounding region for 12 years. We provide debt financing for green building projects wherever you are in the project life cycle. Among other things, we support electrification, 
building energy efficiency, renewables, including rooftop solar and geothermal, and battery storage. While not exclusively working in underserved areas, we have a focus on disadvantaged communities where the need for capital is often the greatest. So on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see we have a wide variety of products to support building owners, project developers, and contractors. Let me just introduce each of them briefly. So we have pre-development and acquisition loans to support early stage project work. This can fund preliminary project work in the case of a pre-development loan like engineering and architectural work. While most of our loans carry a market rate of interest, we offer a special program through New York City Housing Preservation and Development, which offers a 0% interest rate for qualifying affordable housing improvements. We also have green construction and permanent loans. These cover up to 90% of project costs, and we offer both short and long-term financing options, short-term for construction, longer-term for permanent. We offer equipment loans, and again, we can cover up to 90% of project costs, and we offer very flexible terms, whether that's short term or long term, and different collateral packages are possible. We have a new product, which I may talk more about in the Q&A, which is our multifamily express green loan or our MEG loan. And this is designed specifically for condo and co-op owners in New York City to help support local law 97 compliance. So we offer a streamlined process to close with proceeds in as little as six weeks. And we are, because we offer standardization, we're offering smaller loans as small as $200,000 for condo and co-op owners to pay for necessary upgrades, whether efficiency, renewables, storage, or other measures to support local law 97 compliance. We have loans backed by energy services agreements and power purchase agreements. We normally work on these with energy services companies or renewable energy developers. And this can help reduce the cost to the building owner of these products. We also have an incentive bridge loan product, which is very popular to avoid the chicken and egg situation where incentives are only paid once work is done, but work can't get done unless the incentive funds are available. So we provide short-term loans to bridge both Con Ed and NYSERDA incentives. Finally, we offer a PACE loan product. Eric Alini, who you heard from a moment ago, who leads CounterPoint SRE, is an expert in that area, one of the qualified PACE lenders in New York City. So I don't feel the need to say more about that, just know it's part of the product mix. So with that, I'll turn it back to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. And as you can see, um, NYSEEC has a whole suite of um, different products, um, some which get into, as I mentioned, the equipment lending um, or even the um, mortgage um, uh, end of cycle type of product. So um, thank you, Curtis. Um, next, we have uh, Kim from Inclusive Prosperity Capital, and she will discuss her types of products. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, Kim Stevenson, I work with Inclusive Prosperity Capital. Can you, get, can you move the slide? To the next one, thank you. Um, inclusive Prosperity Capital, where a large portion of my work is focused on loan products um, that work for properties that need to uh, secure additional debt to fund energy and resiliency improvements. So these are the mid-cycle properties that um, Andrew um, talked about in his introduction. Inclusive Prosperity Capital is a nonprofit uh, specialty financing institution that spun out of the Connecticut Green Bank. We fund clean energy and resiliency projects, including energy efficiency, renewables like solar PV, energy storage, electrification. We will also finance um, the health and safety and infrastructure measures that are required to enable these energy projects. Um, we have a big focus on underserved markets. These include, um, properties that serve low and moderate income residents and communities, as well as sectors like condominiums and co-ops that may have a harder time securing conventional financing. We will fund both um, affordable and market rate properties. Um, so IPC specializes in providing loans for multifamily and other property types 
that have restrictions on existing debt that prohibit these properties from adding mortgage secured debt or PACE financing. And you've, you know, you've heard more about the, the PACE product from Eric. Um, our loans are alternatively secured to flexibly work with existing debt. We won't do mortgages unless they're actually required by an existing lender as HUD might, might require, but then they would be subordinated. I'd um, just like to uh, highlight um, our Catalyst loan product, which is a combination construction and term loan. Um, this loan goes, uh, has, a, has a term that goes out to 20 years. Um, we will loan as low as $50,000 with Catalyst and go up to $2 million and above uh, funding, um, you know, up to 100% of costs. Um, there's no prepayment penalty with Catalyst, so it can be used as a bridge loan for a couple of years to make those energy improvements. You can take that the loan out if you're going to refinance your property. Um, and as I described, it has alternative flexible security. Um, we also offer a pre-development loan to support all the pre-development work necessary to assess design and scope and energy improvement projects. So if you've got additional costs for pre-development that aren't covered or supported by the New York City Accelerator Technical Assistance, we can help fund that. Um, and just, I'd like to really share why I'm excited about um, sharing these products with you all. Um, they were developed and improved based on about 10 years of work in Connecticut to crack the nut of mid-cycle multifamily housing and get needed capital out into the market to really help uh, improve and preserve the buildings. Um, when we were starting out 10 years ago, we quickly learned that CPACE and mortgages wouldn't work for many, uh, particularly multifamily mid-cycle properties and um, developed financing to fit. Um, so we're excited to share these products with the New York City building owners, and hopefully you all will benefit from the, the learnings of this, this journey to develop these financing solutions that do work. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to Andrew. Thank you, Kim, and, and thanks for that um, discussion and sort of reiterating the differences between the end of cycle and mid cycle and, and how that all comes together. Um, I think we're ready to, um, uh, I will hand it over to John to begin our uh, panel questions. Great, thank you uh, to everybody for the really uh, helpful overview to uh, frame the discussion today. Why don't we jump right in with kind of the base question that I'm sure everybody's thinking about, which is, you know, what do I need to do to get started with financing? Like, where do I go? What are my first steps? You know, what, what do I do first? So um, um, I think I'm gonna start with uh, Andrew and Eric with this first question. So Andrew, you wanna, you wanna give that a shot? Sure, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, you know, at Accelerator, as we work with building owners, the account manager is engaged and financing uh, is being discussed. Um, you know, building owners are in very different stages of this process to, uh, you know, decarbonize their buildings, um, meet local law 97 requirements. Um, some are just starting to get, uh, um, you know, just starting to understand what Local Law 97 is and some of the other laws. Um, they may be uh, starting an audit. The audit could take at minimum of three months, and I think even longer today, it's getting pretty busy. Um, and so what we have found is that the best time to really approach or start thinking, really approach the lenders uh, is when you have a, a well-defined project scope. You've gone through that initial stage. You understand what it is that you're going to do. You might have um, even contractor bids or not, but you do know kind of the, the general scope of what you're going to do, and you know what the cost is. I think those are the two kind of 
necessary elements to start the financing process. We can talk about it before then, but to approach a lender, if you have the scope defined and you know the cost, that's, I think, the best uh, start for, for a lender to, to begin the process. Okay, thanks. And and Eric, you know, how would what would you say to somebody who says, "How do I how do I start this? Where where do I go first? Um, I agree with Andrew. The first thing that we would look at is your general scope. It doesn't have to be finalized. And often, what we'll do is speak with the owner and say, "Have you thought about an energy system that looks like this? Or have you thought about adding your windows or doors? Um, where are they in life?" cycle. But having a general scope of understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it is very helpful because otherwise we're just going to give you a term sheet and then that's going to move around the proceeds amount. And usually a lender's main focus, uh, if in pace you need lender consent from the senior, um, will be, well, how much money are you adding to this property in the debt, in the debt package? And what does it really take to do? And if we start off saying it's a million dollars and then by the time you go through your work, it turns out it's really $5 million, that's gonna start the whole cycle over again. So I totally agree with Andrew. Give us a framework and then we'll be helpful to try and add some other value engineered projects that might be useful to uh, getting yourself closer to your numbers. And then what what if, you know, for, for both of you to follow up, what if I don't know what financing product I should be going after? Like what, what what's the best place to start with that other than listening to this program? Well, um, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, no, I was gonna say that's, you know, exactly what Accelerator is here for um, to help you identify what those products are based on your building, based on what you wanna do. We help you identify them and help you um, navigate through that process. So, I mean, the answer for me is, you know, please come to Accelerator. I totally agree with that. Uh, they act as the uh, as the uh, expert concierge to, to direct you where you need to go, what the best place to be is. Are you trying to do something small that might be a little bit too small for pace, or if you're trying to do something that has different different aspects of your building, uh, the Accelerator can really operate in that fashion. Yeah. Okay. Like that, that, yep. I like that comment, concierge services. <laughs> there you go. Expert concierge. <laughs> Expert concierge. Been elevated. Okay, great. Um, let's talk about the flip side of this. So what, you know, what are some of the common misconceptions about financing energy efficiency and renewable energy upgrades? Um, there's a lot what people think they know, but actually what the reality is. So let's talk about some of those mis misconceptions. And uh, Danielle, why don't we start with you? Sure. And in thinking about this question, I think the, the one thing that I would say is um, one of the biggest misconceptions uh, I can think of is thinking that simple payback is the best way to think about investments in sustainability for your building. Um, investments in clean energy, renewable energy, and sustainability energy efficiency uh, not only improve the, the quality of your building and the overall value of your building, but also the long-term financial health of your building. Uh, and so thinking about the individual measures and their simple payback is maybe selling it short. Um, and you need to think of the holistic picture when you're looking at these energy efficiency upgrades. How is uh, an envelope upgrade going to affect the indoor air quality for my tenants and then create uh, tenant retention for me? Uh, how is the installation of solar PV going to not only maybe cover some of my operational costs, but maybe generate revenue for me? Uh, there are more ways to think about uh, investments in energy than just simple payback. Great. Curtis, what, what are your thoughts on some of those misconceptions? Yeah, I think there are two misconceptions. The first is that there are no technical resources available. And so I would uh, submit that our expert concierge, uh, New York City Accelerator, is a fantastic resource. Um, also, Solar One is another organization that we work with a lot. Um, it's a not for profit that specifically assists in rooftop solar. Um, both of the, those organizations, we feel so strongly about the services they provide that we provide a reduced interest rate on our MEG loan product, our multifamily express green loan product, for organizations or borrowers that collaborate with either Solar One or New York City Accelerator. So that's the first thing that there are no technical resources available. The second thing is that there's no capital available. Um, and there is plenty of capital available. It just depends, I think, and this is why Accelerator is so important, refining what your needs are. What is the scope? What is the project cost? 
if it's a large loan that is suitable for PACE where mortgage lender consent is available, uh, organizations like Eric's are excellent for financing PACE products. They have a long track record in working in various jurisdictions in financing PACE loans. Um, and there are 14 qualified PACE lenders in New York City. So there's a lot of capital there. And for um, situations where mortgage holder consent is not available or it's a smaller loan, um, organizations like NYSEEC or Inclusive Prosperity Capital, both of whom you've heard from today, offer some great solutions. If I could just jump in quickly to add yeah, sure. to what uh, Curtis said is that um, in uh, Solar One is, is, as Curtis mentioned, a, a great resource for determining uh, feasibility of doing solar in your building. Uh, I just wanted to say that Solar One is part of our team as we have our account managers. Um, we have specialists for high performance financing. We also have Solar One who does the, the, um, the analysis for a building owner, again, for free. Um, for solar. So just, just mentioning that Accelerator is sort of the one-stop shop, uh, one-stop shop. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Curtis, we're going to stay with you and bring Kim into this question, which is, you know, if I'm facing a local law 97 penalty, or if like my boiler has reached the end of useful life, can I use one of these mid-cycle financing products, you know, like in the middle of paying my mortgage, um, and then pay it off when I actually refinance the mortgage? Kim, how would you address that? Yeah, so so the answer to that question is absolutely you can. You just need to make sure that you have a loan product or a loan solution that easily enables you to do that. Um, so for example, the Catalyst Loan Program that I talked about earlier enables you to finance your boiler. Um, we purposely don't have prepayment penalties which enable folks to sort of use this product as a bridge loan for a couple of years. And then when they're ready to refinance the property, they, you know, they can take out that loan. There's no prepayment penalty. And what it enables you to do is get those improvements in right away and not have to wait until you're refinancing or rebuilding the capital stack. And, um, you know, and, there, um, there are other solutions out there that will enable you to do that as well. Curtis, go ahead. Great, thanks, Kim. Uh, you heard that PACE requires mortgage holder consent. All of our other products do not explicitly require mortgage holder consent. Now, depending on the kind of mortgage you have, you may have to get consent um, if you wanna do anything to your building, uh, but we don't specifically require mortgage holder consent for any of our other products. Um, and our MEG loan product um, you know, is designed specifically for mid-cycle. So it's fully prepayable without penalty. There's no energy audit required. Um, it can be up to 10 years plus an amortization period. So you're not paying um, principal and interest during the time that the, um, that or plus, yeah, for the construction period plus a 10 year amortization period. So you're not paying principal and interest on the loan during the time work is being done before you have the cash flows from the energy measures. So we're specifically working um, to develop products for mid-cycle improvements. You know, um, Andrew, this question uh, reminds me of something you had mentioned in your presentation, which is when, you're, when you put in these uh, energy upgrades, they're actually saving money off your utility bill, right? Which is a, a financing mechanism in itself sometimes. To what extent are energy performance contracts a, a role in this space, or are there other ways that those savings can be used uh, from a financing standpoint? Uh, I'm sorry, you're directing that to me? Yeah, or anybody on, anybody on the panel, just uh, I know this is, I'm going off script a little bit, but it was something that prompted me from, uh, from uh, Kim's conversation, which is these upgrades um, offer a source of financing in the sense that, you know, your utility bills are going down. So that frees up uh, cash and capital. I, actually, John, if I may, I, I can give a quick response yeah, to sure. that. And that is that um, the way we actually approach underwriting with our uh, loan products, and I think it's similar to the way uh, CPC does this and, and NYSEEC is that what we'll do is we'll take um, 
projected savings from energy, from maintenance, maintenance, possibly even insurance cost savings because that building is getting improved. Um, and we'll take those projected savings and we'll actually use them to help underwrite the loan and determine the loan amount. And then, um, um, you know, we're able to actually leverage those savings um, to give you a loan to help make those capital improvements. You know, and as Danielle mentioned earlier, this, this helps not only reduce energy and operating costs, but it's gonna improve the overall health and value of the building. I'll just add there that CPC published a resource in 2017 that lays this process out and develops this methodology. We called it underwriting efficiency, um, but it is essentially taking those energy savings and incorporating them as an, a reduced expense in the net operating income calculation so that you can leverage more private debt to either cover the incremental cost for doing this work or for any other work that needs to be done in the building. Um, and that resource is on the sustainability page uh, on CPC's website. Great, good. Thanks for uh, addressing that, uh, that particular aspect. Danielle, let's stick with you here. So long-term financing is very effective for reducing annual uh, loan repayments despite higher rates compared to short-term financing, right? Um, so this is critical for managing increased co-op condo assessments for middle to low income residents. How do your financing products address this issue? So our traditional construction lending products, um, we're able to underwrite some form of the efficiency, the savings from efficiency or performance for new construction into the first mortgage and increase that leverage like I talked about. Uh, we do have a specific sustainable mortgage product uh, that is a um, permanent loan product. So that's after you've completed construction and you convert to that longer term financing uh, that gives a reduced uh, interest rate to buildings that are completing uh, work that makes them higher performance. So you have to meet a certain certification standard or complete certain measures. Um, but the building is, no, we, we know, will perform better in the long term, will have a higher value in the long term, and we want to properly value the investment in that asset with that lower interest rate uh, and higher leverage on the loan as well. I think we go up to 85% loan to value on that product. Um, where we're in a really interesting interest rate environment right now, because I think a year ago we would have been talking about long-term debt in different terms. Uh, mortgages were really inexpensive and it was more beneficial to roll all of your efficiency measures into your refinancing and, and renovation that way. Um, but now, you know, the Fed is raising interest rates. We're in sort of a slowed lending environment, at least for long-term debt. Uh, and we've had to look for other ways to pay for this work. And so one of the things that CPC has done is we are administering a $250 million program through the Homes and Community Renewal Agency through the state. Uh, that's the state's housing, affordable housing agency to specifically target electrification in buildings at that mid-cycle point. Um, the Climate Friendly Homes Fund, that's the name of the program, uh, covers 100% of soft costs and hard costs associated with the electrical service upgrades, the equipment installation, the energy audit, uh, and the um, the lending, the legal and lending fees associated with getting this work done. And that's one way that we're trying to tackle um, this high interest rate environment and kind of a slowed ability to create uh, opportunity to do this with long-term financing. Great, thank you, Danielle. Um, Eric, we've, we've mentioned uh, PACE a couple of times. So let's dive into it. Um, how is the New York City Accelerator PACE, um, or how is the New York City PACE program different from other financing products? Um, so as I mentioned, one of the interesting things about it is it is a non-ad valorem voluntary tax. So as I mentioned earlier, when, if you are running or have signed your tenants, if it's an office building or retail, to a green lease, which has now become an older age, where you can pass through these uh, costs of the upfront to improvements, uh, that allows you to split the incentive. That allows you to participate with your tenant for the lower save for the better savings and the lower costs that you're going to get in the building. And the split incentive has always been an issue with uh, tenants and property owners because the property owner has to put up all the money upfront, but then really doesn't recapture those 
value of lower, for example, utility rates or any other rates that might be passed through. So that's one way that it works very well. It is a long-term financing. So as I mentioned, it's generally 25-year, 30-year kind of financing, and it must match the eligible improvements. And Curtis can chime in but because he runs the program. But basically, if you're doing an HVAC system and it has a 25-year uh, lot useful life, that's what you get in sort of the financing on this other side, which helps you balance the savings to investment ratio, the what is my investment and what am I going to get back at an ROI against that? Uh, you know, its rates tend to be right now, their market's about plus 300 ish over the curve, three and a quarter over the curve, uh, over the long part of the curve. So curves inverted right now. So that's very positive. Um, and so you're talking six and three quarters to seven and a quarter kind of rates. Um, and again, we can set these you know, no prepayment penalty as uh, as what, uh, what some are doing is we don't generally do that. There tends to be some call protection associated with it. So if you think you're going to be in your building for the next five years or 10 years or maybe forever, the more call protection lowers that rate and gets it down to the lower side of that cycle. Um, so those are the main ones. We will finance all kinds of buildings. So there's uh, the, as long as your building pays a real estate tax, non for profits we've done in the past. We've done uh, office, we've done multifamily, we've done all kinds of different types of buildings. So they're all eligible. Uh, city buildings are not eligible because they don't really pay taxes. Great. And then the the one of the main differentiators here is you pay back on your property tax bill, right? Correct. Correct. So it pays on the same cycle as the underlying property taxes are. You actually get a line item on your property taxes. It is not deductible the same way property taxes are deductible. It is actually by the IRS code treated similar to a mortgage. So the interest is deductible, but not the principal. Um, so it is it, but it sits a little bit separately. And then as a function of that, <clears throat> if you sell your building and we are a tax, it runs with the land. So if your new property owner wants to accept it, it can move through or you can prepay it, which is why you set the prepayment penalties the way you'd like them to be. Got it. So so what you're saying is the the loan would stay with the building. Um, Correct. Transfer, right. Oh, right. Correct. And if you're going to put in a 25 year system, you know, and you're only going to be your whole period on the building might be five or 10 years, you don't want to pay for it all up front and not necessarily get back at the end when you sell the building, the underlying uh, value that was placed in it. And that's where PACE will then be stretched out over a long period of time. Right, right. And then you need the mortgage holder approval, right? Yes, correct. So you need lender consent. There have been almost, I think it's almost 340 lenders that have consented. Uh, everyone from very large banks like JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, we've done deals with, we're about to do a deal uh, with Bank of America, two very small banks, uh, Amalgamated uh, is a bank in New York City that does a lot of approvals. They like pace a lot. So it just depends on your bank. Um, and often it's very helpful if we go in and talk with your bank together, because a lot of it is just education. You know, how does pace work? How does it how does it function? And how does it affect my loan? Great. Thanks, yeah. Eric. I'll just... Um... I, just if I could jump in just a an, just a little bit of an overview, and you've been covering this in the last uh, few comments and questions, but I just can't overemphasize this comment. Uh, it's in pace. It's been mentioned in some of the other products. The long-term financing, as a you know, um, people are so um, focused on the interest rate, which obviously is important, but it is. Um, you know, the term of the financing and the size of the loan payment um, can be far more effective when we're talking about condos and co-ops and raising um, assessments. Um, it, it is just, it can't be overemphasized. I'd almost put it as one of the misconceptions. And actually we're putting together a, um, a video, an animated video to bring this concept out even more because I we hear it all the time. And I just wanted to add that into the discussion. Great, thanks. Kim, let's switch and talk about affordable housing for a little bit here. Um, so what are the funding options that are available for affordable ho uh, housing buildings or, or buildings in general that are facing hardship? Yeah, sure, John. So um, when we talk about affordable housing, right, in my mind, we're talking about both subsidized rent restricted housing, as well as naturally occurring affordable housing that may not have restrictions, but is serving 
low and moderate income residents. So there's a there's sort of a broad spectrum within that definition. Um, there are a couple of buckets of, of sources of funding to support um, affordable housing. Um, the first place you're always gonna wanna go is to get that free money, get those grants and incentives uh, from um, the utilities and the state agencies. So that's gonna include NYSERDA, Con Edison, National Grid um, that provide both prescriptive and comprehensive uh, uh, incentives on measures that range anywhere from sort of 30 to 80% of a measure. Um, and in order to access these programs, you need to be a customer in good standing. Uh, another incentive program that we all need to be paying attention to is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is you know coming, uh, those funds are, are coming available. Um, then there's um, loans for folks that are not refinancing for mid-cycle properties. So those are products like the ones Curtis has described that NYSEEC offers, that IPC and others offer. Um, potentially grants from foundations, often banks through their Community Reinvestment Act and associated foundations may have low rate loans combined with grant money. Um, and then there's subsidies uh, subsidies and, and loans, low interest rate, uh, concessionary loans from the affordable housing agencies like HBD, HDC, and HCR. Um, you know, and obviously the one thing that you need to be aware of when you're working with those agencies is that you're committing to continuous affordability and rent restrictions. Um, for buildings that are facing hardship, um, you might have to layer these funding sources. So it's really important to think about how to structure them together. Um, and then, you know, as we were talking earlier, you may find that energy and resiliency upgrades actually either, you know, moderately or significantly reduce operating costs. And these can be used to leverage debt and other financing to really get your building whole and stable it, uh, stabilize the building. Um, and then just finally, would like to mention that, you know, Andrew and the Accelerator can put you in touch with technical assistance providers that can help you kind of navigate this world. Great, Kim, thanks for that really helpful overview. So, um, John, if, you don't, if you don't mind, just one second. To yeah. add something. So one thing to note about affordable housing, and I think Curtis can jump in here because it's, he's running the program, but HUD has approved PACE. So uh, they've actually started to go basically region by region. Uh, the program has to apply. Texas has approved it. Uh, some of the other states, I know uh, Curtis has been all over uh, helping that uh, unit, that, that group. And so uh, they will approve projects. Uh, it's been at the national level. And so, uh, you know, I know it's been, I think, a, a focal point of a lot of players. Uh, Fannie does not approve PACE. Freddie will approve PACE. Uh, so both of which would give you an opportunity if you've got multifamily or affordable. But Curtis, I don't know where you guys are, but I know you're working diligently on the process. Yeah, I think uh, just for those uh, listening at home, uh, it may be hard to follow, you know, who will, who won't approve PACE loans. Uh, the important thing is to, you can reach out to NYSE as administrator of New York City's program. You can reach out to Eric and CounterPoint SRE or any of the other qualified lenders who are staying on top of this. Um, the New York City program is about two years old. New York State's program is almost a decade old. So um, the state got a little bit of a head start on the, the five boroughs here, but um, we're doing a lot to try to set the groundwork for a successful program, but certainly reach out to, to us or any of the um, uh, qualified PACE lenders. PACE certainly offers some very strong advantages, one of which I think is, and, and Eric mentioned it, but I wanna amplify it, the transferability of the loan. Um, to do deep retrofits and electrification. These are projects that um, have relatively long time, uh, long return profiles. And in order to see that, you can't always guarantee that you're gonna be in a building three, five, seven, ten 10 years, but because the PACE loan is transferable, you can make those deep retrofits. So it's a really important uh, product for deep decarbonization um, in the city and elsewhere. Great, Curtis. Let's stay with you for our, our last question in this uh, in this section. Then we'll move to the audience Q and A. Um, 
So the New York City uh, PACE financing program is limited to projects of at least um, $500,000, in some cases a million dollars, where mortgage holder consent is available. So let's talk about the smaller projects. What type of financing is available for projects like in the two hundred dollars to $400,000 range? Well, a, a couple of things I would say. First of all, there's no, nothing statutorily that requires PACE loans to be of a minimum, minimum size. It's just that we are in the early stages of the program, and I would guess that uh, lenders like CounterPoint SRE um, want to develop a track record in New York City, as they've been able to do in other jurisdictions. And at that point, once it becomes a very standardized product offering, you may see the minimum project size or minimum pace loan size come down. So I wouldn't say that that's um, by any means uh, fixed. I think uh, we're in early days of New York City C pace. Um, as far as uh, in the interim, what can be done? Uh, all of our loan products have minimum at NYSEQ, um, so moving away from PACE, have minimum loan amounts of less than $500,000. Uh, our MEG loan, which I've talked about a couple of times, equipment loans, ESA, PPA backed loans, our pre development loan products. We actually have a pre development loan product with HPD which has loan sizes as low as ten dollars to $40,000. Um, so we try to be flexible and responsive to building owners. Um, you know, if you have questions, I'll give the brief infomercial here. You know, just reach out, greenloans at niceseek.com, uh, and we're happy to um, look at whatever project you have or direct you back to the accelerator. But, you know, if nothing else, hopefully from this call, you learn that they should be your first call. Yeah, if I can just... Yeah, jump in. Jump, jump in. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, as, as Curtis mentioned, it's not a, a statutory, mm -hmm. but the lenders have minimum sizes for PACE um, down to about 500,000. But there is a bank in California that is looking to become an approved lender uh, in the New York City program. And they have operated uh, out in California doing uh, 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 PACE loans at 250,000. So we're hoping they'll become part of the program and, and that will be available. And the other thing just to mention is um, Kim was mentioning on the uh, Catalyst Loan Program, they spent many years um, finding uh, or developing that product to address um, where PACE kind of left off. And one of those is that they will do loans as small as 50,000. So that's another place where you can finance small loans. Great. Okay, let's uh, transition to uh, the audience questions, of which we have 50 right now, <laughs> which is tremendous. So um, keep them coming. I probably won't be able to get to all of them in the next 30 minutes. So use the up, up vote function uh, to raise the questions you'd like to the top of the list. Um, the one at the very top of the list uh, with five upvotes is what are politicians doing about the fact that New York City's electric grid is not currently able to support the widespread conversion to electric heat. So why don't I jump in and take that uh, from an urban green perspective? You know, we published a report and my colleague, uh, Adam Scheibor, put a link here into this question. Um, last year, we published a report called Grid Ready, where we modeled all 1 million buildings in New York City against the Con Ed grid to answer this very question about what is the room for electrification by zip code and service area. So there's a... a, a interactive map on our website where you could actually go to your neighborhood and, and, and see what what, uh, what availability is there for electrification. Across the city, though, the punchline here is there's a 42% differential between our winter peak and our summer peak. You know, our, our system, our electrical system is built out for the hottest day of the year. Um, and then when we move to winter, when we're not using air conditioning, but we're using fossil fuel heat, all that capacity goes dormant. Um, so there's actually a 42% difference there. So in other words, we have 42% headroom to electrify before you have major issues across the grid, which means decades. Um, and so the, the grid concern shouldn't be a barrier to electrification now. We have plenty of room to start um, and we need to start now. So a good question um, and uh, glad that we could address that. Um, second issue, second question here with uh, five votes is, can anyone speak to the role of improve, uh, improvement in building management practices prior to the pursuit of investment and upgrades? 
Is there any data that shows which technology upgrades are more likely to result in improvements in energy efficiency? So I guess before you get to capital, um, is you know what's the role of management practices, and is there you know does financing look at that at all? Anybody want to take a crack at that? I can speak a little bit to the the measures that we think improve efficiency the most and result in the best savings. Before you're even looking at replacing systems or really doing any serious interventions in the building, uh, building management and demand management is a huge way to increase uh, savings and reduce operational costs. Uh, and so whether that's uh, minor measures to in reduce internal load in apartments so that you don't have to run the heating so, so hard uh, and thereby you're uh, reducing consumption, um, improvements to the envelope either at roofs or uh, through window replacement or additional insulation, those are some of the things that we're seeing as the, the most effective ways without replacing systems to uh, both decrease demand in the building and increase operational savings. Um, John, I would uh, tell the audience to, um, <clears throat> to direct them to Urban Green because if, uh, if the accelerator is the expert concierge, I would consider Urban Green the energy genius bar. And so going on an urban green site and learning about the steam reports that we've done and, and other reports and various pieces of material that have been coming out, the papers really will give property owners a, a, an early understanding of where they are. And uh, again, I couldn't hardly uh, contain, you know, the thoughts of how well these reports are, are written and how much they are helpful to building owners. Right. Thank you, Eric. Anybody else on on this question, we'll move to the next one, Kim. Yeah, I'm just going to say really quickly. I mean, most of these these lending programs, right, require some type of energy assessment or audit to really look at, um, you know, the measures and for each measure that gets implemented, what will that measure deliver in terms of savings and return on investment, and then they'll look at how kind of a combination of measures will impact the building so um you know and 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 it's really important if you've got you know a, a to have this information to know how a certain improvement is going to impact your building and um you know get that upfront audit uh, assessment and that's something that the accelerator can help you figure out where to go and what to do Okay, thanks. Let's move to the next pro, uh, question with six votes. It's a long one. I'm not going to read the whole question here. Let me just paraphrase. Uh, but it starts out with, at, at what point are you seeing building owners opt into the financial programs that we've been talking about? Um, are there any case studies showing the financial value of the programs? Um, you know, uh, what's the uptake here and, and, and what can people learn from what you're doing? I'll just okay. say that okay. no, I would just say that if you're looking at specific measures or uh, systems replacement, CPC has a number of case studies on our website that look into uh, how we underwrite projects where we we have seen um, specific energy improvements uh, and how those improvements have resulted in additional leverage uh, leverage for uh, private debt. Okay. Uh, the, the thing I would say about the projects is um, we actually are getting close to publishing a report on realized energy cost savings. We sort of sampled a number of our projects over the decade plus we've been operating. The realization rate we see is not 100%, but it's over 90%. So it's very exciting. Um, it varies by project technology, and there are some idiosyncratic variables. And I guess if I had done this study, I wish there wouldn't have been a global pandemic in the backdrop, which impacted occupancy rates. So it's a kind of hard study to do, but um, generally we see really strong um, energy cost savings relative to expectation. The other thing I'll just say anecdotally is that we see a lot of other benefits. And again, it varies on the type of technology. So for example, we've done high performance buildings and a lot of the tenants and building owners comment on the quietness of the building. You know, can you put a dollar amount on that? No, but um, the passive house or the zero net energy design is typically a very tight design 
it's very quiet. We see a lot of comments about thermal comfort. Uh, we've also done projects where um, we've seen resilience benefits, for example, storage. Um, the grid is not 100% perfect. Sometimes the power goes down. Having some added resilience is important. So I think all of us in the finance community, and Danielle spoke about this earlier, about the um, concerns associated with payback. Uh, I think we are all trained to think about energy cost savings versus the investment, but there are actually a lot of other benefits that I think are really important that sometimes get um, pushed aside. Okay, next question here. What are the unique uh, financing options available to co-ops and condos? Yeah, um, I'll continue on here if I may. Um, so, you know, based on our customer feedback, we designed a product specifically for that, our multifamily express green product, our mid loan. Uh, it's an easy application, no energy audit, covers up to 90% of project costs very streamlined um, application to close within six weeks, assuming all the data is available. Um, we offer a 50 basis point reduction in interest rates for people who work with the accelerator, because uh, we feel so strongly about the services that they provide. Um, we're actually waiving closing fees until March 31st for people who are applying. Um, and it's fully prepayable without penalty. So, you know, we've designed a product that we think is flexible uh, does not explicitly require mortgage holder consent. Obviously, every building is different in terms of the arrangements it has in place, but um, we would encourage people to take a look at that. We've designed it specifically for co-ops and condos. The larger buildings um, you know, can typically access capital. Um, buildings that are coming to the point of a refinancing uh, can work with you know, Danielle or CPC or other organizations to put in place a green mortgage. Um, but we wanted a product specifically for mid-cycle for small to mid-sized buildings in the city. Yeah, and I will I will just add to that that Inclusive Prosperity Capital has you know done something similar to NYSEEC where our um, Catalyst Loan Program is a solution also for condominiums and co-ops. We'll go down to fifty thousand dollars. We'll have a loan term that's out to 20 years. And again, you know, these are not mortgage secured loans. Um, with condos and co-ops, the way we actually uh, look at these loans and secure them is we'll take a collateral assignment of the, you know, the condo or co-op homeowner fees um, and, and work with the condo association or the co-op association um, to come up with a flexible solution that will work with that property. I guess I'll just jump in that um, PACE financing is available for co-ops. It is not available for condominiums um, simply because condominiums are a group of individually owned units. Um, so that sort of comes under the category of residential PACE. We have commercial PACE in New York City um, not many states have adopted residential pace for homeowners, um, but you can, um, as um, um, Kim has mentioned, that um, the, the condominium, again, the, the catalyst program picks up where, where pace leaves off and they can finance the condominiums. Okay, next question here is on pace. So it's a question about the program so far, how many buildings, how's it, how's it going? Who, who can give us, uh, Curtis, you want to give us an update on uh, where, the, where the PACE stands right now? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so the program launched a couple of years ago in a pilot phase, um, and we learned a lot from the pilot phase. Uh, there have been two transactions done, so small in number but large in size, representing over $100 million of financing, which actually makes it one of the 10 largest programs in the country, even though it's in its you know, pilot phase. Um, the program has been open and up and running since September for existing buildings. Uh, for new construction, it's subject to additional rulemaking. I know that everybody is very keen to get new construction in place. We are very keen to see it in place. Um, unfortunately, it just requires some added rulemaking on the part of the city. Uh, in New York State, it took seven years from the initial program until, um, until new construction was approved. We are not using that as our benchmark. We want to move much faster, but um, that's uh, that's where we are. So open for business for existing buildings. 
and uh, looking forward to seeing uh, the program uh, expanded for new construction. Okay. Um, let's see here. Next question uh, is about preventative maintenance. Can you, you know, we see a big rush to do building upgrades um, without much discussion about incentivizing preventative maintenance programs on refrigeration, air conditioning, heating, et cetera. Um, you know, systems that can degrade over time. So what, what role does maintenance, preventative maintenance play here? Um, and, you know, how do financing providers think about that? Um, I, I can take that one. Um, so uh, like, thank you. This is a great question, right? Um, and um, one of the things we do at Inclusive Prosperity Capital is we, we obviously do our underwriting based on looking at projected energy savings from implementation of measures that are going to include not only weatherization, but high efficiency heating and cooling systems and also, you know, potentially electrification of buildings. And what we do as part of our uh, loan program is we require um, benchmarking and energy performance monitoring and verification. So um, you need to be monitoring your building with a system that's compatible with the DOE portfolio manager system. And what this does is it really lets both you as an owner know and us as a lender know, are those energy efficiency improvements working? Are you getting what you need from those improvements? And if you're not, like, let's take a look at that data and let's make sure we're kind of doing continuous looking, continuous commissioning, of that property, if it's not performing the way it should be, um, bring the right folks in to keep those keep keep that performance high, keep that carbon out of the atmosphere, and you know make sure the building is running smoothly. And the importance of doing this can't be underestimated. Um, I'll just say one other thing is is that it's generally after the first, possibly the second year that you really get degradation of performance. So you really wanna be doing that checking like a year out after systems have been uh, implemented. Great, thanks, Kim. Next question here back to PACE. What is the effective rate of a PACE loan? There's several questions in here. Um, can you prepay it or are you locked into 25 to 30 years? Um, and are there any special rates for landmark areas, including co-ops? There's another question here, but let's let's take those. Um, payment cycle and special rates for landmarks. Um, so uh, payment cycle term, as I mentioned, is usually 25 years. Uh, the prepayment is flexible, so you can move it around. It will affect the rate. So the shorter the prepayment, the higher the rate. As I mentioned, generally the rates right now are plus or minus 300 basis points or 3% above uh, the underlying uh, treasury curve. Um, and again, that will be affected by the prepayments. Uh, are there specific rates for landmark? Um, we're actually working on a landmark building we're about to bring into Curtis that, uh, that could work on it. We don't necessarily change the rate for the landmark. It just really depends on how the, how the underlying financials work. Um, so it really just depends on the financials of the comp of the business. Now the pace is non-recourse to the owner. So it really is only based on the, on the property itself. Um, so it, we look at the underlying property of the, let's say the, the landmark building or the non-for-profit and how it runs its particular property. Okay. Uh, and a follow on here in this questionnaire about inclusive prosperity loans, um, if your building does not have an existing mortgage, is this still available? Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay, uh, let's see, we did that question. Uh, next question, how does a building know how much money it needs before it engages in specific projects? We talked about this a little bit, but maybe we can dive into it more. Um, I, I think we discussed the fact that you, it's probably uh, best to engage an energy engineer, um, have them come think about what you need to get accomplished. 
uh, is in specific, if you're trying to uh, respond to a local law 97 issue, it does, you should engage an engineer so that you put the right project in place to lower your carbon as required. Uh, once that happens, then I think you would engage a, either a local contractor or uh, a developer, depending on the type of project you want to look at. Yeah, I think the, as we had said, the, the, the energy audit is a great tool for determining the work, the cost, the savings. That's a good way to, to get that information. And some of the loan products require the audit and the audit can also be financed in the financing, the cost of the audit. Yeah, Andrew, let's talk about that for a second and a follow up here. So if, uh, if somebody wants to do that type of audit, um, walk through the steps on they contact you, what happens next? Yeah, so the um, accelerator, it's one of the services we would help you with. Um, the account manager will, will focus on that with you. We have done an, an RFQ for service providers. I think we have about 160 different service providers that we have vetted um, and we can make available to you. And within those service providers are energy auditors or engineers that provide that uh, do energy audits. And so we can direct you to them. There's also uh, more extensive studies done that NYSERDA um, um, uh, um, sponsors and will will help uh, cost share with you. But yes, the, the account manager at the accelerator can has lots of information to help you help direct you. Okay. Next question here. Are there any examples of electrification retrofits for large market rate apartment buildings? Um, I'll start with that to say, you know, check out the nicer Empire Buildings Challenge, uh, which is uh, doing that, um, and they have a website uh, uh, with uh, examples there. But anybody else want any any uh, resources or um, examples that anybody on the panel wants to point to? Uh, I, we've done a number of high performance buildings, electrification, passive house, zero net energy. They've actually all been in the affordable housing sector. But I would encourage people to look at our deal spotlight section. Um, generally, affordable housing is the more complicated sector to do these because capital structures are often more complicated and the, um, the return is, is often lower because of um, regulation around the rents that can be charged. Yeah, and I'll just jump in and say that um, CPC's Financing High Performance Guide has a number of electrification uh, case studies in it where you can see the savings that have proven out over time based on building performance and how we underwrote those buildings and what we may have been able to do if we had underwritten performance, um, as well as a passive house uh, study that we published with HPD, Stephen Winter Associates, uh, and Bright Power uh, on the CPC website. So it gives you a sense of what the performance is going to be out of an electrified building, but those were all affordable housing. Okay, next question here, uh, Andrew, actually is a good follow on to what you just mentioned. So what's the process for service providers to partner with the accelerator to be listed as one of your vendors? Uh, yeah, so I can, if, if you just reach out to us, we, um, there is a um, kind of a lead as a, our service provider program um, and probably the RFQ for service providers is on our website but we can certainly connect you to it um, so you can become part of that part of that group. Um, the service providers are pretty excited about it. Um, we have um, lots of um, kind of outreach and marketing that we do in partnership with the service providers. They, they actually can, um, they put a, um, a badge like an, a, um, an accelerator badge on their website. A lot of it, it all kind of works together as a partnership. It's been very effective. Okay, thank you. Next question, what would incentivize building owners to take on debt to finance energy efficiency projects if they're planning to leave or sell the building in the near future? Anybody want to take that? I'll just note that one thing we've seen um, as the industry shifts and as we uh, as we as sort of a real estate um, finance uh, ecosystem, recognize that investments in energy efficiency actually translate to better performance and long-term uh, sustainability for the asset. 
appraisers are valuing investments in energy more highly, um, and they're finding more and more comps with which to do that. Um, so investments in energy efficiency can be recaptured at the point of sale because we are now valuing those investments uh, in the way that they should be. Um, I would take the negative side of that, uh, which is the, sometimes the only way you can actually get real estate owners to move. Um, interestingly enough, uh, JBL, JLL recently did a study that said that energy efficient buildings generate about 5.4% higher NOI and 11% higher in sales. So combine that with a recent Fed study or Fed comment uh, at the Rebney conference, where they said that they believe that over the next few years, non-energy, non-green buildings or brown buildings might see a 100 to 200 basis point hit in their cap rate. So if you're not green and you're not sustainable and you're not meeting your local law 97 goals, the chances in a few years of a buyer looking at your building and saying, I'm going to have to do these retrofits anyway and ding it from your price or decide to move to a different building to buy where they don't have to put up the work and the time, I think is very high. And that difference is going to cause property owners to think about what are needs to be done across the board to fix the buildings. Because then if you are going to be the brown building, you become the stranded asset. And that's not a good place to be if you want to sell your building. Great. Thanks, Eric. Next question here, can co-ops with paid off mortgages get CPACE loans? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the process is even easier because then you don't need mortgage consent. Great. Got it. Next question. Um, with, oh, just jumping around here. Uh, with PACE, can tax credits help reduce property taxes? Um, you can't use the tax credit to pay your pace, but obviously with the economic, you know, structure of your, of your um, building, if you're getting money back from a tax credit, you can use that money to pay the pace, but it doesn't actually reduce the actual payment. Okay. Um, Next question, I'm actually going to group a couple. I saw another one lower down, but it's around the same one here. It's regarding the federal funds and rebate programs that are available or starting to flow. So this particular question is, any sense of how New York State is progressing on setting up the mechanisms to allocate, allocate equipment rebate funds from the IRA? But let's take that, but expand it. In, in what role does um, like the heat pump incentives, for example, for electrification, and other federal incentives that we know are going to flow. How, how does that interchange or intertwine with the financing products that you're uh, offering? I mean, just as a general statement, whenever we look at financing, we look at financing net of incentives. So the amount you want to finance is after incentives. However, the incentives uh, don't always come at the outset. So uh, I know Curtis and others have mentioned the sort of bridge to the incentives. So some of these financing products will fund the whole project until the incentive comes in, and then you can either pocket the money or pay off part of the loan. But um, I think the, the main point is that those incentives are just another source of funding uh, outside of the loan. Yeah, I don't think the... Um... The, the newer incentives are going to impact any of what the this panel does. I think it just reduces the amount of debt required. For example, if the ITC goes from 30 to 50 percent, or if there's a new um, grant available, it just reduces the amount of debt to put on a building and lowers the effective cost for the borrower. So um, right now, those rules are still being uh, put together, and it will be a while. Um, until there's clear guidance, but people should be aware of that. Um, it's going to make projects even more attractive in the coming years. Okay, um, well, yeah, I, right in, okay. Kim. yeah, I just want to add one more thing to that. So um, one of the ways we're looking at that question is that with the Inflation Reduction Act and some of those really significant incentives that are anticipated, 
more of the energy implementation costs are going to be covered, but you're going to potentially need debt for infrastructure improvements to enable electrification or health and safety measures like lead, asbestos, um, replacing leaky roofs uh, to enable solar, other things, and that um, the scope of what we will fund will, will grow and increase to really enable those energy measures to be implemented. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, we're end, at the end of our period for the audience Q&A, so I want to thank all the audience members for the terrific questions that were uh, posed. Really appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank the panel here for a fantastic discussion. Kim, Curtis, Andrew, Danielle, Eric, thank you for sharing your expertise today on what may be the number one asked question <laughs> in New York City and the buildings community right now is how do I finance all of this? Uh, so thanks for your time. I want to turn this over to my colleague, uh, Ellen, uh, Ellen Honestock, to uh, wind up the program. Ellen, over to you. Thanks, John. That was that was a fantastic event. We've been planning it for months, and it just exceeded expectations. Thank you so much. So we have some events coming up. Uh, our spring member reception is on March 15th. You don't have to be a member to join. If you want to come and meet everybody, it's a great op opportunity to network. And we're going to be doing a part two of this event on March 23rd. It's not up on the registration page, but it will be shortly. And we'll cover different financing opportunities. For all events, you can register at urbangreencouncil.org slash events. So thank you very much to everyone. This was a, this is really, this is such a good event. Um, we're so pleased to be partnering with the New York City Accelerator. And they are your, um, your first stop to find out options about how to finance projects that you are building. The slides and a recording of this event will be available on the event page on our website soon. So please check that page uh, or YouTube for the recording. We'll also email everyone who registered as soon as these items are ready. Thank you so much for attending and have a great day.